when I was 17 or 18, I remember I'd been tramping in the woods. I was coming home when I began to get a sort of a picture. It came to me just so that I could actually see things. I stopped in the hazel brush and stood there for half an hour while a picture came to me as to what I could make. I saw a little village and the families in it. Some of the people would be carpenters, some would be mechanics, some of them would be philosophers. We'd find ways to make our living and we'd be selling things so that we'd be independent and uh, we'd get our own food. The teachers would have their families there and the pupils would be living in the same houses with the teachers. It would be a community of explorers, inventors, teachers and students, a friendly group. We'd be philosophizing together. That was a very childish picture, of course, but I just remember clearly now being there walking along the path in the hazel brush and suddenly this picture coming to me and I stood there half an hour. St. Cloud, Minnesota, about 1895. A boy of 17 or 18 has a vision, a calling. His is the archetypal American story. He has grown up on the edge of a wilderness, his home on a dirt street, disappearing into a swampy virgin forest. He dreams of how life might be better than it is, how people might be happier and more fulfilled. But his resources for changing the world are small. The church, his mother's church, is the cultural force which defines the good life. Mother has a stern religious view. She teaches discipline and self-denial. Father, a surveyor, avoids the house. He is a free-thinking, easy-going man whom the boy sometimes has to fetch from bars. The boy's earliest enemy is his own flesh. His cousin recalls those days. He wanted to be strong. He, he wanted to be physically strong, and he never was very physically strong. He would sleep in a cold, cold room with, uh, with few covers on purpose. On purpose he would do that, so he would get strong. I'd had this uh, cerebral meningitis, and I was uh, in poor shape, and I, I wondered whether it was possible for a person in my shape to uh, come back. And I, I used to argue with myself about it. He must also overcome the conditioning of his environment. I asked myself, is there some reason that I can't understand why I would be given the craving to inquire and why it should then at the same time be wicked for me to do so? And the outcome was I worried it out and I finally said, I've got to ask questions. And I went further than that. I said to myself, I've got to ask all questions. Is there any place where I stop? I must be free to ask questions. He didn't pay much attention to what the teacher said. He had his own idea. At that time on the frontier, for a person to go into the woods, just to go into the woods, that showed he was a nut. If he went to shoot squirrels, I was all right. But just to go out in the woods, why would a person do that? Always the woods calling. He sleeps little, wandering in the forest hours before dawn, observing, thinking, putting the pieces of nature together in his mind, discovering himself in nature, nature in himself, the uses mind can make of nature once it understands life's principles. It was Darwin's theory of evolution which broke the shell of his background. He records his life and thought, bit by bit. The dream has many pieces. The 
creative mind dwells apart. The world within is larger than the world outside. The hometown is too small. The high school is insufficient. The library has limits. He teaches school for a year in a Minnesota village, but is dissatisfied with himself as a teacher. He is unprepared. His mind is stored with disturbing questions, but friends who can answer his questions or even care about them are few. The boy goes to the river, to the Mississippi, and with a dollar and a half in his pocket, he mounts a log and floats south. He has set out to achieve his vision. In the American adventure, boys always run away from home. I told mother I was going out to husk corn on a farm. And I went out to husk corn on a farm. And I did that until that husking was done. And the Mississippi was only about uh, 15 miles away. I walked over to Mississippi and, and got on a log and floated down to Minneapolis. <laughs> How big a log was it? Oh, it was, oh, it was a big log, uh, I suppose, pretty near three feet through. And you just sat on it? I just sat on it with a piece of bark to steer with. And your feet hanging over the edge? Big part. And your feet hanging over the edge? Yes, they're curled up under me. <laughs> and How far did you go? A, lo a lot of logs floating down there. We came one place where they, 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 jammed. they jammed in from both sides. There's a little place not any wider than this uh, table here, where the, all, all the open. I got my log straight, but it, it went through that you know, just like a shot. And uh, there was a log underneath that uh, turned my log over. So <laughs> I was in the water. <laughs> I had to climb back on the log. Did you find the same log again? Yes, same log. I didn't let that get there. Well, I went down, uh, and then I got pretty near to Minneapolis, and I got a farmer to let me sleep in his barn overnight. And I went to Minneapolis and hunted a job, and I hunted and hunted, and I couldn't find a job. Then I walked across country, and find it, I'd find a little work with a farmer here and there. Mm -hmm. I uh, walked across Minnesota and across Iowa, and then into Nebraska. Rites of passage, a trek into the plains and mountains. He needs schooling, skills, discipline, strength of character, strength of body. He tries college, giving it up because of failing eyesight and lack of funds. He takes all the odd jobs in the American saga, fruit picker, ranch hand, farm laborer, a logging camp, a coal mine. His diary records his loneliness. Went to the library to read. There was a stove there and I was cold. Made 15 cents, same as I made yesterday. Have nothing left to eat except a small handful of corn and I feel blue. He sets out with a wagon load of books hoping to peddle them to Colorado miners. He never sells a book, but reads every one. At the turn of the century, the young man returns home. His childhood was his mother's. His young manhood is his father's. Assiduously, he learns the surveyor's trade, his father's way of judging issues, his way of dealing with crews, the camaraderie of men in the field. Working in the north woods of Minnesota gives the young surveyor time to think. How shall I free myself from necessity? If I rebel and become immoral, she masters me by force. If I am obedient and moral, I am her slave. If I am her enthusiastic lover, her kind embrace but disguises the immutable grasp she has upon me. So the only way I see of being free from necessity is to follow her most eagerly and hunt out her desires before she forces them upon us. 
In that way, she comes to give us a continually larger range to move about in. Much of the area is lost land, inundated by swamps. How can land be reclaimed? How can necessity be exploited for human advantage? A young man discovers that the world is reluctant to be transformed. Men must be swayed. Laws must be changed. Political swamps must also be drained. Necessity is limitless in its demand. death of a young wife. Labor in the field is replaced by labor at the desk. He corresponds with engineers all over the state, mustering the power to influence the legislature. His career is the control of water, but his mission is social change. Responsibility for federal assignments. Arkansas, Colorado, Louisiana, Tennessee, Florida. And as he works, he searches for a site on which to build the community of his vision. He leaves government service to form his own company, specializing in water control. Too often the men on his staff seem limited in their grasp of the total situation. He wishes to devote a portion of his profits to the liberal education of engineers. He discovers stagnation in the Everglades. Not of water, but of men. Public figures are implicated in a scheme to inflate land values, and he exposes the corruption through the newspapers. In his vision, good will prevail when the truth is generally known. A young teacher graduating from Wellesley becomes his life partner. As a team, they plan to find the setting for education which is deep and thorough and lifelong, integrated into the life of a community. He raises a family and learns from his children as they learn from life. He is ready now to build his vision when his chance comes. Opportunity comes in the form of disaster. The worst flood in American history to that time. Dayton, Ohio, engages an engineer for the purpose of flood prevention. But this engineer is a visionary who sees the control of water as only a piece of a larger pattern. It is conservation and renewal of the entire basin of the Miami River which excites his imagination. Right up there, and I could see they didn't know where they were going. We had no precedent for it. Never had a big city like that been washed out. So I had to break the pattern somewhat.
And, uh, and of course, I had to let the lawyers put this in legal language. But they say, there's no law like this. You can't do this. But I say, that's what we've got to do. Find a way to do it. And they almost fired me, I think. But I'd say, this, this has got to be done. Now find a way to do it. He finds a way. The Miami Conservancy District becomes a prototype for the Tennessee Valley Authority. The dams are built without locks, so that rusty machinery will never bring on disaster. Planned communities, recreation areas, lakes and landscapes, schools. It is not just a means of flood control. It is a revolution in social thinking. Dayton has asked a technical question, and it is answered by a man who insists on seeing life whole. As always, he regards education as a central human problem. A new opportunity comes in the form of a failing college in the nearby community of Yellow Springs a backwater village letting the 20th century pass it by. Antioch College is there, founded by Horace Mann in the mid-19th century, but now limping along with a handful of students, a skimpy budget, a lack of purpose. This is not the fresh start in education he has sought, but after all, his specialty is reclamation of lost ground. And he's once again pioneering. He is working against the odds, but his vision spreads. In a few brief years, he brings the college to a position of national prominence and achieves a reputation as one of the nation's most progressive educators, whose view seems compounded of equal parts of idealism and practicality. The 16 years of his presidency established Antioch as a permanent and distinctive landmark in American education. But I did have this overall picture that I want to touch all phases of human development. Now probably that is helped by my own experience. Though the college changes, it owes its root ideas to his shaping. But I, it is part of a, a philosophy. Education shall be devoted to discovering significance and purpose. Life and labor and learning shall be inseparable. Technical education shall be secondary to education for man's central human needs. Students shall have a voice in governing themselves. Discovering and pursuing human purpose shall be the central mission of inquiry. And we shall always consider the whole, the relation of the part to the whole. Community and college shall flourish together. In later life, he continues to consider Yellow Springs his home and Antioch one of his major concerns. The college and village embody much of his dreams. I tried to see in my mind what are the factors that would enter into a good human environment. One was uh, economics. And uh, we built uh, a dozen little industries here. We turned over our government. It was a rotten government. Now we got one of the best little governments in the United States. School system was down at the bottom. We got an extra good school system. But While I'm his spirit and search here. transform village and college, to some he seems autocratic. His vision is not always shared by the specialists he brings in to implement it. His gift has been in the form of ideas and energy. But he makes mistakes too because of his inexperience as an educator. He knows his vision in the hazel brush has not been fully realized when he leaves to accept a new challenge. I went to see the president. He said that he wanted to talk with me about my being head of the Tennessee Valley Authority. I said, why, Mr. President, you don't know me. He said, haven't I been reading Antioch notes all this time? I like your vision. I said, I have certain ideas about government. I think that the habit of patronage is a more deep-seated harm than is recognized. I don't want to have to play politics that way. 
He pounded his fist on the table and said, there'll be no politics in this. Mere survival calls for new pioneering on our part. And I mean everything that that word pioneer implies. To carve the earth and tame its waters, to invigorate its fields and forests, villages and towns, natural areas, recreational areas, local industries, studies in forest genetics, development of new crops, new game, new uses of the land, new patterns of community. To survive, an environment must provide for its own conservation and renewal. On a larger scale than ever before, planned, self-sufficient communities are launched in which all human needs are addressed. For it is in the primary social units, the family, the community, that values are formed and purposes defined. It is on the level of community life that man becomes most fully human. TVA is an enormous success in renewing the total environment. As an institution, it bears the deep imprint of his forming vision. But like Antioch, it is in some respects a personal disappointment. He is dissatisfied with some of the methods by which its success was achieved and takes his complaint to the president. But the president does not back him and a conflict of wills ensues. Having taken a position of principle, he will not bend. And so is broken. Yesterday evening, I received a telegram from the White House to the effect that uh, the president was sending me a letter removing me from the position of chairman of the Tennessee Valley Authority. I have not uh, as yet received that letter at the White House, I challenged the right and the power of the president to take that action. The Tennessee Valley Authority... Again, he has seen partial views, acquiescence to customary patterns. Seven months later, he has a chance to make his case before Congress. Specifically, I charge, one, inaccurate and misrepresentative reports to the President, the Congress, and the public. Two, mismanagement of the power program. The TVA includes vast projects of the government in business. <coughs> Proper administration of such projects demands vigorous, open, and impartial conduct of that business. There is no place in such conduct for concessions, confidential agreements, or yielding to improper use of power and influence, political or otherwise. He has not yet found the means and personal capacity to make his vision happen in the only available world. At the age men think of retiring, he undertakes a career of finding ways to make his ideals work. As a boy, he had been interested in utopian thinking and now he produces scholarly criticism of utopias. In North Carolina, Finland, India, Ghana, on a Seneca reservation in New York State, in Yellow Springs, he advises people struggling to achieve self-sufficiency and community. In India, he helps establish a village where life is on a human scale, where people have some capacity for seeing life whole.
not an American, but an Indian, Vishwan, whose ideas seem most harmonious with his own. Together they're striving to build the kind of community the young man envisioned in the hazel brush. The blueprints call for adventure and exploration concerning life's purposes. The vision is that inquiry will bring understanding. That understanding will create a sense of mission. That the individual will see his own interests as inseparable from those of the species. Whether the human race has a great future or a not great future, will it gets down to almost an, an, uh, the, the behavior of individuals. If, if I can be decent, perhaps my neighbor will <laughs> be a little more decent. If, if my children can get a, a sense of, uh, of, of values, uh, perhaps their children can. Perhaps their neighbor's children can. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Becky. Happy birthday. The good man, we have believed, prevails by strength of character. Communities of good men maximize human potential. When the terms are defined by face-to-face -face relationships, the hardy frontier virtues do seem to create the good life. His story, like the story of Lincoln, or Edison, or Ford, or the Wright brothers, or Frost, or Sandberg, or Frank Lloyd Wright, tells of a hero who grew to manhood in an environment in which the virtues were personal strength, integrity, toil, planning, courage, persistence, realism, vision, honesty, trust, firm and far-sighted purpose. That catalogue of virtues is embedded deep in our heritage. We have been taught that those qualities are the means to great achievement. But in the industrialized, urbanized, specialized, depersonalized civilization of 20th century America, individual worth often seems negated. <laughs> 